the day that the Lord has made. Yes. You're not here by accident. You're here on purpose. God has allowed us to gather in this place one more time, to lift our hands, to lift our voices, to humble ourselves in his presence. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. We bless his name today because God alone is worthy. Amen. Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hallelujah be your name, O God. Glory be God, thou to receive praise, Father God. I thank you, Lord, for another chance to stand in your presence, to seek your face, to lift my voice, and to humble myself in your presence. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would purify these thy people, that everything in us, O oh God, that is not like you, that you will reveal it and remove it, so that we, O oh God, might stand worthy, Father God, to be received by you and to receive from you everything that you have in store for us. We pray, oh God, that you will arrest and render powerless every spirit that would seek to exalt itself in this place. We pray, oh God, that death, Lord, that sickness, that disease, that lack, that everything that comes against your people, oh God, might be driven out in Jesus' name. So that the fullness of your spirit, oh God, the joy that you said is in your presence might manifest today. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Move today in power, Lord. Be glorified, magnified, exalted to the highest place. For we stand in anticipation and expectation of a mighty move and the flow of your spirit. We give you the glory, the honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Come on, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah again. Bless his name. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. We come for no other reason than to magnify your name. Come on, put those hands together and give God some praise in this place. Because he's good. We just want to thank you, Lord. You're mighty God. You're awesome God. We came to sing about how awesome our God is. Can we testify to that today? Come on, let's go. Come on, put those hands together. Hey, yeah. We just want to sing about how awesome you, God, you are. We want to bless your name and praise your name because you sit high and look low. And you reign over us, oh God. Reign in us, oh God. Hey, yeah, yeah, yes. Come on. Song says, Lord, Lord, you are an awesome God. Lord, you are an awesome God. Sing the kings is what you all say. Sing the kings is what you all say. Oh, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, yeah. Lord, you are an awesome God. King of kings is what you are. One more time from there. Come on, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, yeah. Lord, you are an awesome God. King of kings is what you are. King of kings is what you are. Everybody say, Lord, you are an awesome God, yeah. Lord, what you are, yeah, and that's why we praise you, we praise you, oh, we praise you, we praise you, yeah, yeah, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, say, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, King of kings is what you are, yeah, one more time, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, yeah, what you are, yeah, and that's why we praise you, come on and praise him, Lord, we praise you, yeah, come on, say, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, say, say, Lord, you are an awesome God, King of kings is what
Lord, you are. King of kings. Oh, I say, Lord, you are an awesome God, yeah. Lord, you are an awesome God. King of kings is what you are. Say, we bow before your presence, Lord. We bow before your presence. We give you holy reverence. We give you holy We worship and adore. We worship and adore you, Lord. With the sacrifice of praise, with the sacrifice of praise. Come on and put your hands on it right there. If you love to praise the Lord, come on and put your hands on it right there. We came to sing about how holy and righteous our God is. Anybody else serve a mighty God like that? Come on. Hey, yeah. Come on. He's holy and he's righteous. Quiet, help me say, our Lord, our, the Lord our God is holy. The Lord our God is holy. Come on. The Lord our God is That's holy. That's all we're saying. The Lord our God Just is tell the truth. He's holy. The Lord our God is holy. And he's righteous. The Lord our God is righteous. The Lord. The Lord our God is Yeah. Holy. Yeah. Lord is he's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. Yes, he is. Yes. He's a holy God. He's a holy God. Jesus, he's a righteous God. He's a righteous God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. Yes, you are God. Yeah, he's a loving God. He's a loving God. Yeah, he's a loving God. He's a loving God. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. He's a righteous God. He's a righteous God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. You're so awesome. Yes, you are. He's a holy God. He's a holy God. Yes. He's a loving God. He's a loving God. Oh, oh yes. He's a righteous God. He's a righteous God. Yes, he is. Yes, he the is. Lord, our, the Lord our God is holy. He's righteous. The Lord our God is righteous. He's holy. Yes, he is. The Lord our God is holy. He's righteous. The Lord our God is holy. The Lord our God. He's holy. And he's righteous. Yeah. He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. Yes. He's a holy God. He's a holy God. He's so holy. Yes, you are. He's a loving God. He's a loving God. Oh. He's a righteous God. He's a righteous God. Yes, he is. If you will truly believe it, thank you for being awesome in my life, God. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. You're so mighty. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sometimes we go to God looking for blessings. And instead of thinking about what we should do first to receive that blessing, God will never hold anything back from you. But he wants to see what you're willing to do for it. Are you willing to make room for him? I want to ask you something. Do you have enough room for Jesus this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Quick answer would be yes, but then you got to really search yourself yeah. and see the little distractions and the clutter and the little minute things that you think won't get in the way, but they do. Yeah. 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 Pastor Nick was talking about service and being a slave to God. If you have even two or three things that you're thinking about over God, you're being a slave to that. You're not being a complete servant and sold out for Christ. So I want to make sure that we're making room for God this morning. Whatever it is, God, whatever it is, remove it from our lives and make room for yourself in our hearts, Lord. That's our decree this morning. Oh, song says, I find space for what I treasure. I make time for what I want. Well, I choose my priorities Lord. and Jesus. 
Jesus, you're my number one. So I will make room for you. I will prepare for two so you don't feel that you can't live here. Please live in me. Yes. Oh, please live in me, God. Yes. Choir, come on and help me say, I find space. I find space for what I make time. I make time for what I choose my priority. Jesus, you're my number one. So what are we going to do? So I will make room. See, I will. I will prepare. Prepare. So you. So you. We don't want you to feel that you can't. Can't live here no more. Please live in me. Yeah. Oh. One more time, can we all say, I find space, yes. I find space for what I make time, I make time for what What are you making time for? I I choose my priority. And Jesus, you're my number one. Jesus, you're my number one. So I will, so I will make room, make room. See, I will, I'll prepare for two. So you, so you don't feel you can live here. Please live in me. Prepare for two, yes. So you don't feel that you can't live here, yes. Please live in me, yes. See, I will, yeah. I will make room. I'll move the clutter out your way, Jesus. I'll prepare for two. Time say can live here, yeah. Oh, see, I will, yes. I, I'm gonna make room for you, Jesus. Oh, I will prepare for two, yes. So you.
that's not like you, Father. Whatever it is, I don't want it there, no. So I will make room for you. So I will make room. Whatever it is that's in your way. Jesus, you can move it over. If you want to move it over, you can move it over. Search my heart, Lord. Clean me up, Jesus, yes. So I will make room, yes. So I find space for what I tread. I make time for what I want. I choose my priorities. Jesus, you're my number one. Hallelujah. You're my number one. Make room. Make room for Jesus. If any of you felt anything of what I felt, that song is extremely convicting. In all the right ways, but extremely convicting. The Lord has given us that freedom to choose our priorities. And if we're going to be honest, this week, if we just look back over this week, there were probably times where we should have prioritized things Jesus would have us do. Not just how we feel, not just what we think, not just where we think Jesus might be in our lives. He is the head of our lives if we are Christian. Amen? There is no question about that. But there are things that Jesus might call us to do in a given time and we choose to do other things. But even in that moment of conviction, the Lord just reminded me of how good he truly is. In Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. See, we have a high priest who's able to sympathize with us when we don't make room. Come on now. Yeah, come on now. We have a high priest who is able to sympathize when we don't make room. He's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. See, what the Lord is saying to us now is if you felt that conviction, if you recognize there's things in your life that you need to move out of the way, he's calling you to approach the throne of grace. Yeah. In this moment, on Sunday mornings, we come together as a family to pray. And I'm calling for those who maybe just feel like you need to approach the throne of grace. Any who might be Feeling the need to approach the throne of grace. Come. Approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, we need the Lord. We need the Lord. 
Some of us may want the Lord, and that's a great desire for us to want the Lord, but the reality is we need the Lord. We need the Lord to take our next breath. We need the Lord to blink our eyes. We need the Lord for everything in our lives. We need the Lord to help us to make room for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make room for you. I will prepare for two so you don't feel that you can't live here. Please live me yes. I will make room for you. I will make it a confession of our hearts. No longer a song. Make it a confession of our hearts. It's no longer a song. Make it a confession. I will make room for you. I will prepare for two. So Lord God, we are before you speechless, God, in all of your grace. Lord God, I, some of us, we, Lord God, have recognized the areas where we don't make room for you. We recognize the areas, Lord God, where we fall short. And God, in this moment, we ask, Lord God, that you would forgive us, Lord. You would forgive us for our faults and our failures, Lord God. You would forgive us for prioritizing foolishness above you, Father God. Lord, all things in your sight, God, other than your son, Jesus Christ, they pale so far in comparison, Father God, but so often we give them so much attention. We allow them, Lord, to take our eyes off you. We allow them, Lord God, to frustrate us. We allow them, Lord God, to build our heart attitudes. We allow them, Lord God, to make us do things we don't desire to do. We allow things that don't matter, God, to shape and mold our character. And I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit right now, you will begin to reveal those things in our lives, in our hearts, in our character, Lord God that we need to move in order to make room for you to feel. God, our hearts are intricate organs within us, Lord God. But Lord, even more than the physical organ, Lord God, it's that spiritual heart that we need to clear out, God. And so, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, if it's forgiveness we need to extend, I pray you would grant us the grace to be able to do it. I pray, Lord God, that if, if it's bitterness that has taken root in our heart over things that have happened in our past, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, you would allow us to release it. I pray, Lord God, if it's lies that we are believing, lies that we might believe about ourselves, lies that the enemy has implanted in our heart, lies that we might believe about others, lies that we might believe about you, Lord God, because anything that is not of your word is not truth. So God, we pray in the name of Jesus, you will begin to clear out those areas in our hearts where we don't believe what you say, Lord God, and help us to hear what you say, Lord God, so that we might begin to believe what you say, Lord God. Help us to begin to meditate on scripture day and night, Lord God. Help our hearts, Lord, to be healed by your word, Lord God. We thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, God, for your power. We thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you, God, for your mercy. We thank you, God, for your sovereignty. We thank you, God, that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord God, help us to rest in that mercy. Help us to rest in the salvation that was promised to us before time existed. 
Help us, Lord God, to believe in you. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us, Lord. Help us to know that when your spirit convicts us, Lord God, it is to turn us toward you, not to push us away. So help us to recognize, Lord God, that we don't have to be ashamed or afraid in your sight. You know everything we've done before we've even done it. You know everything we will do. You know all about our past. You know our ins and outs. You know us better than we know ourselves. So help us, Lord, not to try to cover ourselves with leaves that won't cover. Help us, Lord God, not to try to hide the guilt that we feel from the things that we've done. But help us, Lord God, to have the strength to confess our sins, Lord God. Knowing, Lord, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us, Lord God, and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Restore the joy of our salvation to those who have lost joy, to those, Lord God, that peace seems so fleeting, Lord God, to those who just can't rest, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would meet them this morning. You would meet them right where they sit. Lord God, we come in here on Sunday mornings and we'll put on our Sunday face. We'll put on our Sunday best. We'll put on everything that Sunday calls us to put on except for the truth. Lord, help us to put on truth this morning. If we're not feeling it, Lord God, help us to confess we're not feeling it. Lord, if we are... If our spirit is just in the wrong place in any way, shape, or form, help us to know, Lord, that you are able to deal with us in all of our emotional insecurities, in all of our emotional ways, Lord God. Help us to know that we can come to you in truth, even though we can come to the next to us. Help us to know that we can come to you, Lord God. Lord, everybody might not understand what we've been through. Everybody might not understand what we're going through. Everybody might not understand what we need to hear, Lord God, but you know. You know, God. So where there is no rest, Lord God, in this world, help us to find Where there is no peace, Lord God, in this world, help us to find it in you. You are the source of all life. You are the source of all peace. You are the source of all joy. You are the source of all happiness. You are our all and all. Help us to see it that way. Help us to extend ourselves to others the way you extend yourself to us. Lord God, we want to pray this morning for our sick and shut in. Lord, we have brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, who have been in car accidents, who are in the hospital, Lord, calling on your name, Lord God. We want to pray, Lord God, specifically for the governor, Lord God, Richard Boyd, who is in need of prayer, Lord God. We thank you for him, Lord God. We thank you for his leadership. We thank you, Lord God, for his testimony. We thank you, Lord God, for the power that you've placed in his life. We thank you, Lord God, for the love that he expresses to us day in and day out, Father. So we pray on his behalf right now, Lord God. We're giving thanks for our very own Pastor Kevin, Lord God, who was in a car accident, Lord. And we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We, we thank you, Lord, that he has a praise report, that he is fine. But we just pray that you would comfort and bless his family, Lord God. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that if he has any fears, worries, or doubts, that you would wipe them out, Father God. And we pray, Lord God, that you might steal the hand of Satan in his life, Lord, because we know, Lord God, Satan comes here to steal, kill, and destroy, Lord God. But you came that we might have life and life more abundantly, Lord. So we thank you, Lord God, for that life of abundance that you promised to us, Lord. Help us to walk in it, Lord God. Help us to grab a hold of it, Lord God. Help us to keep it, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to fight for it, Lord, when it tries to run away. Help us, Lord God, to have a battling spirit, Lord God. A spirit that desires to have all that you have promised us. Lord, I thank you for your people this morning. Lord, just as I, I look out Amongst all of these people who are gathered here today in your name to give you worship, to give you praise, Lord God, 
I thank you, Lord, that you have collected a people all your own, Lord, that sing your praises, Lord God, that hear your voice. And Lord, I pray for any that are here that might not know you in the pardon of their sins, Lord God. I pray, God, that this morning they might come to know you, that they might see that there is more to this, Lord God, than nice suits, a beautiful building, all the history, but that there is a real God who sits on high and looks on low and truly saves people from their sins and transforms them into the likeness of the image of his son. Lord, have your way among us. I give thanks, Lord God, for our music ministry, Lord God, and even this choice of song this morning, Lord God. We will make room for you, Lord God. We will make room for you in our service, Lord God. Get us out of the way and help us to make room for you. May we not be so bound to our order of service that we don't hear you. May we not be so bound to the way things are supposed to go that we don't see you when you move. Help us to make room for you, Lord God. May it be a confession of our heart. May it be a confession of our week. May we be able to come back next week if you shall tarry, Lord, and be able to say, I made room for Jesus this week. I truly made room for Jesus this week. Help our lives to change. In any way, Lord God, you need them to change. Help them to change. Be with us and bless us. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say, amen, amen, amen. I will. furniture of your life around I don't know about you but sometimes when you walk into your house and you know where everything is you know like the light can be off and, and you know the two steps to the left so you don't bump your little toe that's what a couch is and a table is right in front of that I don't know about you but, but I measure myself around the house sometimes but if you've ever moved things around you have to be more careful and how you walk because you get so used to a certain type of pattern that if something does change outside of your control we stumble over those things and I think sometimes God wants us to lead wants to lead us in different pathways I remember Dr. Eric Walsh I've shared this in several places Dr. Eric Walsh who used to be the director of the Pasadena Health Department as a both a Christian pastor and minister but also as a as a doctor and I don't know what his doctor was in but a medical doctor he talked about neural pathways you know the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made right yeah. and so God knitted us together in our mother's womb and he made us fearfully and wonderfully and dr. Walsh talks about neural pathways that as you grow in life because your brain is such an incredible muscle 
organ, whatever it is, that as you think consistently, your brain creates neural pathways. So once you get into a habit, you've learned how to respond and how to do things. Like ever sometimes somebody will say something and you automatically get angry? Or you automatically say things? That's because in your brain there's a pathway that the neurons travel. And Dr. Wall said that those things never change. It will always be there. What you have to do is you have to create another one. That's why the Bible says that we have to be renewed in our minds. That the spiritual transformation takes place when God begins to move things in our minds and we think differently. We respond differently. And when the Lord comes into our lives, I believe that we have to give him, and I say this with all honor to the Lord, we have to give the Lord permission to change the way we think about things. I think a verse in the song said, Lord, you can move that over. My attitude, Lord, you can move that over. The way I think about things, you can move that over. And I believe that when we give God the permission and the ability to move things in our lives, then we find ourselves in his presence more often. Come on, somebody, because I will make room for two. I see that little intimate setting that oftentimes we make for our loved ones on birthdays and holidays and Valentine's Day. And you set the table just for two. That intimate setting where you can just be in the presence of the one you love. And I believe that's what God is trying to do in our hearts. He's trying to move stuff out of the way so that he can set that table. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, Jesus said, I will come in and I will sup with you and you with me. I pray that today that as we just move on in the service that God will continue to reveal to us what what is in the way of my being in God's presence right now. Is it what I'm thinking about later on in the day? Have I made anything else a priority? Because, go back to just, show me the first verse. I love that. It shows the ability that we have to process the information. The first song, I will with the priorities. I don't know the song, but I'm going to by the end of this week. (laughs) This is my testimony. Anybody? I find space for what I treasure. That's not deep. I don't need to go to go to seminary to explain that to you. I make time for what I want. I choose my priorities. But today, Jesus, you're my number. So I will make room for you. I will make room for two so you don't feel that you can't live here. God just doesn't want to inhabit the sanctuary of friendship. He wants to inhabit the sanctuary of your heart. Prepare a place for him. Hallelujah. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Can you give the Lord just one more hand of praise? Woo, glory to God. And I thank Pastor Nick for being obedient to the to the unction of the Spirit of God this, this morning, I, I reached for my Bible, and he reached for his. And I said, brother, you have a word for the moment? He said, yes, I do. I said, then speak that word. And I'm praying that we'll recognize, amen, the giftings that are in this house. It's not who's next. It's that God gets all the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God for what he's doing in this place. We always take time on Sunday mornings to acknowledge any of our first-time visitors, anybody that might be here for the first time. We ask that you would honor us and bless us just by giving us your name what might have brought you so we can give you just a little information about ourselves and friendship so are there any first time visitors in the house will you god bless you god bless you amen amen please remain standing please remain standing god bless you ushers are on their way to give you a little bit of information about us but if you could give us a little information about you i'm gonna start to my right your left with our dear sister just your name and what might have brought you this morning
Well, praise God. Welcome. God bless you this morning. Yes, ma'am, right here. All right. Well, guess what? <laughs> praise God. Welcome. Yes, my brother. Praise God. God bless you, my, my brother. Yes, ma'am. Praise God. Welcome. Thank God for you this morning. Yes, young man. Blue shirt. Praise God. Amen. Somebody's happier here, brother. I don't know if you know the sister. <laughs> yes, sir. The Briscoes. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, on behalf of the Friendship Pasadena Church family, we welcome you to worship with us today. We pray that you've just caught a glimpse of our love for God and the fact that we make room, we move everything out of the way so that the spirit, the power, and the presence of God might be felt and experienced in you today. So we thank you again for joining us. We ask God's blessings upon you. Right now, the friendship members are going to turn right where they are, give it a little extra. <laughs> Notice what I said. Turn right where you are, give a little extra love. Welcome to Friendship Pasadena this morning. Come on, y'all.
few brief announcements as we press on forward. Again, we want to make sure that everyone um, is connected with our uh, social media platforms through uh, our Facebook page, through our um, website, uh, through all of the means by which we try to get information to the family of believers so that this connected church might continue to grow and share the good things that God is, is doing. Keep on liking our friendship page. Keep on liking our post. Not, not just like them, love them. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Sister Janice uh, uh, Porter is doing an, an incredible job. Amen. And the entire media team, she just continues just the entire creativity that is coming out of our media team and, and, and the gifts that God is bringing to that effort is, is really promoting us as we go forward. We're live streaming today. Yes, team, yay men. So to our Facebook family, again, bless you. We send a special love gift to you. Can y'all just bless the folks that might be watching? <laughs> It'd be great to have you come on down and bless, get blessed, and we will be blessed by you. Um, all ministry leaders are asked to attend. Uh, that word asked, I want to put that in, 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 is asked to attend the leadership training seminar on Saturday, June 15th from 9 to 1. If you are a leader, if you hold a position, if you desire to hold a position, if you just want to know more about leadership and what God is doing specifically in this place called friendship, there is an expectation laid upon leaders that you are availing yourselves of these gatherings. Please do not consider this as an option. No one is going to chase you down. No one is going to come knocking on your door. But if you are a leader, you will be held accountable. Amen. One amen. Let me say that again. Amen. As a leader, you will be held accountable amen. for the position that you were elected to, for the position that you volunteered to. We are seeking to raise the standard in our leadership, raise the standard in our commitment and connection to the Friendship Family. As a matter of fact, I really want to ask the Friendship Family to recommit yourself to the ministries of this place called Friendship. We know that you are very busy in, in your lives. We, we know that you're pulled in many different directions. But we also believe that this is a season of incredible opportunity and possibility, that this is one of those Kairos moments. God is beginning to bring the gifts and talents, not only in the house, but the opportunities on the outside for the friendship family to be used incredibly. And you always hear me quote from Ephesians where Paul talks about the body of Christ, that it is so important that every member of the body does its job so that we are not bearing the burdens of someone else's responsibilities. The Bible says that we bear each other's burdens, but God requires us to hold up our own responsibilities so that your responsibilities don't become somebody else's burden. And somebody say amen. Praise God. Let's make sure that we are all participating. So that leadership training seminar is June 15th from 9 to 1. You will be blessed by that. Also, there have been a couple of date changes. Graduation Sunday has been switched from next Sunday to the third Sunday, June 16th. And the youth summer camp at Camp Pondo is now June 24th through the 28th. So please mark your calendars. Again, graduation Sunday was changed from uh, next week Sunday to uh, June 16th. And the summer camp is um, on June 24th to the 28th. Because next Sunday, and again, these, these, this Sunday seems to creep up on me and I need to apologize to y'all and apologize to the Lord. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Now, Pentecost Sunday, as much as we celebrate every other holy day from Resurrection Sunday to the birth of Christ, which, which we call Christmas, Resurrection Sunday is the day that we remember that God gave birth to the church in power. Amen. Amen. That, that the, the church for which Jesus died and rose again and poured out his spirit was a church that was born in supernatural power. And we cannot substitute programs for power. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the programs. Thank God for the things that, that we do. But when we begin to sub programs for power, I believe we become not only like the Laodicean church, that lukewarm church, we become like the Ephesian church that Jesus wrote, had John write the letter to in Revelations, where he said, I know your works. I know you're doing a lot of wonderful things. But if you do not go back and do the first things first, Jesus said, I'll remove your candlestick out of my presence. I believe that perhaps something that is even worse than a dead church is a church that exists with no presence. 
I don't want to be one of those houses of worship, and this is not to diminish or demean anybody else's ministry, but I don't want to be a house of worship that has a lot of interesting things going on, a lot of ministries and a lot of outreach, but the presence of God is sorely lacking. We seek to press so hard and so deeply into God's presence that he orders our steps, and therefore we can do what we do with God's glory. So let's come next week with a prayerful expectation and a purposeful preparation this week. Prepare yourself next week, this week, for next week. Amen. So that when we arrive in this place, and, and I'm going to be talking to our minister of music, and, and just so we can literally prepare that atmosphere that God said that he dwells in the midst of. God dwells in the midst of worship, not just music. But God is attracted to, he dwells in the midst of, he manifests his presence in the midst of genuine worship. So prepare your heart on next week to come. Should the Lord tarry, Jesus might come tomorrow. But if he doesn't, we're going to be here next week and give God some glory. Amen. Um, also, again, just to add to that prayer list that Pastor Nick made uh, mention of, we're also praying for Sister Wanda Franklin, Sister Bernetta Wilson, who's in the hospital, Brother uh, Richard Boyd. Sister Barbara Turner, who is healing at home, and today is her birthday. So just in case, Sister Turner might be watching on Facebook. Can we sing? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy Sister Barbara. Sister Barbara. Happy birthday. Point at. Hey. Oh, hey, man! Hey. Sister Bernetta is. Hey, Bernetta's here! <laughs> so, word of you being in the hospital is not quite correct, is it? You are now home. You're here. Praise God. Praise Amen. God. How many of you know that prayer hey. changes things? Hey. We prayed our sister right out of the hospital. <laughs> she disappeared before our eyes. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. And as you heard also that uh, Pastor Kevin uh, did have an uh, automobile uh, accident. We're praying for the family. He is home. Uh, he is healing. But uh, we need to pray for um, the entire family and for the entire friendship Pasadena Church family because so much is, is going on. The enemy is busy, but God is real. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, now we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Can we get some love for those opportunities? Again, for our guests and those who may not understand uh, how God works in, in this place, Friendship Pasadena Church is one of those churches that we believe that you are the steward of the financial blessings God brings into your life. And the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. We should not give grudgingly nor of necessity, but because we know how good God has been to us, Amen. we return back unto him that portion of our finances that he has set forth in his word. A tithe is 10% right. of what comes into your financial control. An offering is above and beyond that. But because you are the stewards of that which God puts into your hands, we believe, I believe, that you should, as much as is possible, know that the soil that you're sowing your spiritual seed as well as your physical seed into is fertile soil. We ask you, examine what God is doing in this place. Look at the things that God is doing both inside the church and through us he is allowing us to do out in the community. And we believe that you will find that this is fertile soil. So if you're a tither or if you have an offering, I want you to take that gift, raise it before the Lord, and believe that you're about to plant a seed in the kingdom work of this place called friendship. If you're ready, let's proceed. This is the offering I bring to God, the seed of faith I sow. I give it in faith, I give it in love, I give it in obedience. I believe the promise that he has made, and I shall reap the harvest that he has promised, however he chooses to bring it my way. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we bless your name this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for pouring out so abundantly of your spirit into our lives. Oh God, we pray that the word that finds fertile soil in us, that it might continue to produce spiritual seed 30, 60, 100 times over that which was sown. And as we now sow this financial seed 
into the spiritual soil of friendship. We pray that you grant the same return. We ask, oh God, that you bless the gift. We ask that you bless the giver. We pray today that you would bless even those who have a desire, but today they may not have the means. Father God, increase their faith. Increase their store of seed so that they might know the joy of sowing and reaping. We love you, we bless you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You are now in the hands of your ushers. for the Lord in here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on and put your hands together. Song says, I'm a soldier yeah. on the battlefield and I'm fighting. Fighting for the Lord. Yeah. I promise him I would serve him until I die and I'm fighting. Yes, I am. Fighting for the Lord. I had heartaches and pain, sun shining and rain, but I'm fighting, yes I am. Fighting for the Lord. I've been up and I've been down, but I've never turned around, cause I'm fighting, yes I am. Fighting for the Lord. Oh, if I hold on. Yes, I am. Fighting for the On this Christian journey, I've had heartaches and pain. Sunshine and rain, but I'm fighting. Yes, I am. Fighting for the Lord. Oh, I've been up and I've been down, but never turned around. Cause I'm fighting. Yes, I am. Fighting for the Lord. Oh, if I hold. Fighting. fighting for the Lord. Come on, put your hands together right there. 
If we got some soldiers in this place, can you stand up on your feet and put your feet on it? Come on. Act like the devil's head is right up under your feet and stomp the devil's head. Come on, we're soldiers for Jesus this morning. We love you, Jesus. We'll fight for you, Jesus. Yes. Come on, say, I'm on the battlefield. Say, I'm on the battlefield, yeah. Hey, yes, I'm on, yeah, yeah. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, yeah, yeah. Everybody say, I'm on, say. I'm on the battlefield, fight I'm going to stay right by your side, yes. Yes. I'll put the devil right under my feet, I'm on. I'm on the I'm fighting for you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Who's on the Lord's side? Yeah, yeah. You got to identify what side you're on. There are no neutral parties in this battle. Amen. We are in the midst of a spiritual warfare that is raging all around us, raging within this nation for the soul of America. But God is sovereign over every land. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. No matter what transpires, amen, we know that God is in control, but he has entrusted us, the body of Christ, to represent him well here on earth. Jesus said that when the Spirit of God comes upon us that we shall receive power and we shall be his witnesses. witnesses. Witnessing for the Lord is more than just knocking on doors and standing on corners and handing out pamphlets. That's a part of it. But the life you live, the living witness of who you are 24-7, people are looking at you. Jesus said, let your light so shine. It's not always what you say. What you say does matter. But Jesus said, let your light so shine before men, first of all, that they may see your good works. People are watching you. They're watching to see how you act and react and interact. And Jesus said that that is what your witness is. Let your, the light of God so shine in you so that people might watch you, see God in you, and be drawn to that light. That's what this Christian mission is all about. But when you leave here with purpose and on purpose, and you're determined to make a change. You are determined simply to stand for the Lord and to represent him well. You become an enemy of the state because we live in a world that is lost in sin, that is covered in darkness. And the Bible says that men whose deeds are evil, they hate the light because light reveals what's in a person's heart. But we're called to shine anyway. And we're going to keep on shining for Jesus. Can you thank God again for this, the music ministry of friendship? Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. Okay, so on the first Sunday of May, it's already been a month, we started the series called Relentless. Does that word, did that word still resonate more than with just my sister behind me? Does anybody else still revealing, I mean, getting anything from the word relentless. I, and, and, and I don't know if it's just me, but, you know, has, has anybody ever, like, bought a new car? And, well, that's great. Praise God. But then you start seeing that car, like, everywhere. Like, you didn't really notice it until you bought it and now you have it. I've been hearing the word relentless 
all over the place. I'm hearing it in, in sports. I'm hearing it in the news. I'm hearing it just in conversation. And not just with friendship folks, but it just seems as though there is, there is, there is life in the word relentless. And like I said, that word began to resound in me, and I'm finding that it's bearing fruit in other people's lives. But it was on the first Sunday of May, again, all the way to last week, that we started this series called Relentless. And back then, even, uh, I said that I want to be much more relentless in my pursuit of God's will for my life and even for this house. But it's no small task to be incessant, persistent, continuing, continuous, nonstop, lasting, never-ending, steady, uninterrupted, unabated, unbroken, interminable, unstoppable, unceasing, endless, unending, and perpetual, all at the same time. That's what the word, that's just a fraction of what relentless means. And so when you say you want to be relentless, you're really signing up for something that is deep in and of itself. But since that's how the Lord has been with us, God's love for us has been relentless. Y'all do know that, right? That even when we weren't lovable, even when we turned our back on God, God never gave up on us. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus did not give up. Jesus did not relent in his pursuit of you. From the beginning of time, the love story of the word that begins in Genesis after the fall of man is that God has been in pursuit of his fallen creation at just the right time he sent his son to pay the price for sin that you and I could not afford so that we might be brought back to that place of complete unity and fellowship with God. God was and is relentless. And so since God has exhibited that kind of love for us, that kind of love for me, I believe that we should return that same kind of relentless attitude and live in the same way. I'll amen that myself. That's good preaching, Pastor. We started in Luke chapter 5 with, with the four men who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus. You remember that story? That the, there was a man who was paralyzed and had four friends that were determined. They were relentless in getting their friend to Jesus. They determined that nothing was going to stop them. Parking lot was full. No seats anywhere. And so they could have said, well, listen, let's come back tomorrow. Let's come back ne next week. No, they went up on the roof, tore open the roof, lowered the man on the mat right in front of Jesus. Get cut in line. Amen. Sometimes you've got to break protocol when you're so desperate that you need Jesus. Amen, some, somebody. So, so, okay, so maybe there's nobody that's been desperate in this place, but somebody I'm sure has heard the term, sometimes when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, I don't need permission. I'm going to go ahead and do all that I can to get into God's presence. These people were so relentless, they tore open the roof, lowered him on the mat, and the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, even though their faith was not to bring a blessing to them, they were working so hard to make sure that someone they were concerned about, someone that they love, could at least have an audience with Jesus. Because all you can do, literally, is get somebody in God's presence. Then, that's up to God. We can't force the Lord to do anything. But I believe that when God sees that we are relentless in our pursuit of him, and are relentless in making sure that our family, that our loved ones, that our community, that our world knows that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that God moves in incredible ways when we prove ourselves to be relentless. So uh, today I want to focus on the Apostle Paul. This message is actually two weeks old because it was the message that I was going to bring when we um, had the Bryson Strong, the uh, play and the dance that Sister not Naja Benson did for the family with the young boy who had the heart transplant. Bryson, I, the, I, yeah, I said Bryson or Tyson? Okay, Bryson, yeah. That, that, so we did, that. but when after that, Sister Naja gave basically the gospel. She talked about God's love, his death, his burial, his return. And so I'm like, listen, that if, if we're waiting for a word, and we actually just miss the word, then we may not even understand the word at all. So for a couple of weeks, you know, that this has been kind of marinating on me. And again, I want to thank Pastor Nick who, 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 who uh, bolstered the message of being relentless last week on relentless leadership. What a, what a, what a, again, a, just a, a master class of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. You've, you've heard me say so often that I believe that 
this gospel message, this hybrid gospel that is being preached has, has, has so altered and watered down God's word that God's standard has been lowered so very low that we don't even understand what it means to be a servant. A servant has no, no opinion. We're simply told what to do, and we do it. There's somewhere in Scripture where Jesus says that our attitude as servants, as slaves of the Lord, should be that after we've done everything that God has told us to do, we still should say, I'm a weak and unprofitable servant because all I've done is what I was commanded. God may take you to the highest heights. He may open doors, have you preach to millions, or just minister to one. And you may see God do incredible things. Bring somebody out of darkness into the marvelous light. Even bring salvation. And you might say, Lord, thank you for using me. But even though he used me, Lord, if it wasn't for you using me, nothing would have come out of my life. So it's about, listen, everything I have, I give back to the Lord. So Pastor Nick's sermon on last week just caused this message to be altered for that reason. Because just like last week, Pastor Nick's sermon was on relentless leadership. I want to use as a topic relentless discipleship. That we need to understand really what discipleship looks like. Now, each one of us, God calls individually. He puts certain things before us that he might not put before other people. He, 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 he gifts us and blesses us according to our ability to handle what he gives us. Jesus told the parable about the man that had the three servants, gave one five, gave one three, gave another one. And each one, it was given according to their ability to handle it. And so God may lay something on you that he may not lay on someone else. But whatever God, whatever God blesses you with, he's going to equip you with the ability to get it done. God is not going to put more on you than you can handle. So the goal might be lofty. You might feel like you're out of your depth. That's when you should say thank you. Lord, I thank you because what you said before me, I can't accomplish on my own. I need thee every hour. So if your vision isn't big enough, if you don't have to trust God for what you really believe God's called you to do, Maybe you don't have, as someone might say, a God-sized vision. God will give you a vision that is out of your reach, beyond your personal capacity to do it on your own, so that when it's done, you'll have to say, Lord, thank you. You, That had to be you that opened that door. That had to be you that moved that mountain. So I want to just focus on Paul, and I'm going to try to move through this. uh, Trusting that those of us who know the Word of God will know some of these stories, but Paul was not always Paul. The apostle Paul was not always an apostle. Just like you were not always saved, nor were you a church member, nor had the grace of God been extended to you. All of us at one time found ourselves in a, in a place separated from God. So before we, you know, kind of criticize other folks who have yet to come out of darkness, let's remember from where we've come. That before we point the finger at those who are not yet saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, don't forget that you weren't always saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. That, that, that some of us are filled with a whole lot of other stuff. Amen. And God might still be trying to get some of that stuff out of us. Can anybody testify to that effect? Praise God. God is still working on us all. But Paul, to me, Saul, to me, is one of the, the kinds of, of encounters with God that I pray that, that, that we would aspire to. We first meet Paul, actually Saul, in Acts chapter 7. Not, not going there yet, so just kind of uh, stay with me un, un, until I direct you where to go. We first meet Saul in Acts chapter 7 at the death of Stephen the evangelist. During that time, he, he held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen and agreed with their actions. So Paul was, Saul actually, was a religious person. And at that time, the way Christianity was this new power in the midst of the people that folks were trying to make sense of. They had the Old Testament law and the things that God told them to do, but now the fulfillment of everything that they had been taught was presented to them in the person of Christ. And because they really weren't yet in tune with what God was doing, they sought to stop this new move called the way or the church if you will. 
And so Stephen was, the, was an evangelist. He was out there preaching the good news and bringing people into a saving relationship with Christ. But those that were still trying to defend the old way of the law took issue with Stephen. And so they brought him to basically to testify. And Stephen's testimony literally went through the entire story of Israel's history up to the point where he now confronted them with the fact that Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of everything that they had learned for generations, had been brought to them. But they killed him. He just flips the strip and said, you all killed him. But God raised him from the dead. And that created an uproar. People don't want to be confronted with their religious insecurities. And oftentimes when you do that, that's when your conversations over your Thanksgiving dinner go south. That's why sometimes Christmas gets messed up because grandma always want to talk about Jesus and Jesus is a reason for the season and y'all just want to get to the turkey and open your old presents. So sometimes we don't want to be confronted with those things. But Stephen confronts them even to the point of looking up and saying, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they began to stone Stephen to death. And Saul was not a participant, as we know, in the stoning but he approved of the action. The Lord dropped this thing in my spirit that I was meditating on this. See, sometimes we think that there's a difference between those who agree with and those who actually do a thing. See, Saul was in agreement. He didn't throw stones as far as we know in this one, but he gave his consent. And he said, I'll hold your jacket so that your throwing arm don't get caught up. So I want to tell those, 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 those who hold the cloaks of those who throw the stones that you are equally on the line for your actions, that you might not be causing the ruckus. I'm not talking about friendship now. I'm talking about those other places, that you might not be causing the ruckus, but if you make it easy for those to talk about a work as opposed to those that are actually doing the work, be very careful. God is going to hold you accountable also. Because as time went on, Saul went from a, a coat monitor to an active assailant on God's word, threatening people, chasing people, and arresting the followers. Saul was relentless even before Jesus was in his life. He had a passion for the law without a knowledge of the Lord. But when he met Jesus face to face, he had a first point of this message is a powerful conversion. That if we want to really talk about what it means to be a relentless disciple, I believe that there has to be a time in your life where you came face to face with the reality of who Jesus really was, not the Jesus that your grandma told you about, not the Jesus that you just heard about in some story, that Jesus that got your attention and spoke to your heart and brought that conviction that I'm not living the way God wants me to live. If you've never had one of those personal encounters where you realize that my life apart from Jesus is leading me to hell, I would counsel you go back to square one. Because a disciple is someone who realizes that I have been going my own way far too long. I tell the story all the time of when I was in my 20s. And y'all probably tired of me telling this story, but just act like you've never heard it for those that have... As a kid, as a young man, I came and sat up there right where my brother, is that brother Milton? Yeah, somewhere right where my brother-in-law right now is sitting because I came in late. I was in my mid-20s. I, I, I got high before I came to church, I, you know, and, 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 and did the cover-up thing that you do when you're young. You know, if, if, I, if I chew enough gum and if I use enough cologne and if I put on my glasses, nobody's going to know that I'm under the influence. Am I alone in that assessment of what it used to be. I know we all been saved your whole life, but I'm talking about those that remember, you know, when you didn't want your mama, didn't want your friends, didn't want your pastor to know that you were still dabbling out in the world. So I came to church about 11:15 because the program said that, so, that certain things would be happening and no one was going to be in the vestibule. So I parked my car on the Lacey, came in the side road and slipped up there and I was safe and secure until the word of God started being preached. And however many feet it is from here to there, that pastor's message was just thumping me in my chest. But I was a church member. I've been raised in friendship. Sat under the amazing teaching of Marvin T. Robinson and 
and, and, and the follow-up ministry of, of Stanley Lewis. And, and, you know, my father and parents were members of the church, and I was part of the youth choir and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But I was lost in sin. And that word got on me and got in me, and I'm sitting up there, and I started to shake and cry because I realized, because a man was talking about sincerity. He says sincerity has nothing to do with it. He said, because you can be sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. And he was just reading my script up and down. And when the time came for the invitation, I felt as though God grabbed me by my shirt collar and lifted me up. And I walked down this aisle. And everybody's turning and saying, ain't that Fletcher's boy? He's already a church member. Yeah, I was a church member. But I was lost in my sin. And I had not yet been converted. I had not changed. I had not delivered, given myself over completely. I had not surrendered as a servant to the Lordship of Christ. And so I wonder today if, 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 if that story in some way can be altered and you find yourself in that same place. Have you ever been confronted with, with, with how vile your sin really is? Have you ever been confronted, personally confronted with yourself that your life separated from God always leads toward hell and death? That the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. If there has not been a confrontation and a conversion in your life, then I ask you to really ask yourself, am I really a disciple? Not just a follower. Jesus had a lot of followers, but he only had a, full, a few real disciples. Y'all do know that, right? That there was a lot of people that were following Jesus, especially after he fed them real good. In John chapter 5, you know that after service they had a fish fry. And he fed them all with fish and bread. And they said, that's the best fish sandwich? I'm going to come back to that church, man, because they feed you with fish and bread. And they followed Jesus, and the next day Jesus seemed to flip the script. Folks need to understand, God didn't die and send his son to make you feel better. God didn't send his son just so that we could just, you know, not be sick anymore or not struggle anymore. He called us out of darkness to serve him. To be disciples and followers, a disciplined group of folks to demonstrate to the world that Jesus Christ is real. Not because my life is just without problems, but in the midst of my problems, God is still good. That no matter what happens in my life, God still blesses me. So Paul has this powerful conversion, even though you know it, Acts chapter 9, verse 1, I'm going to try to read some things and refer to other things because I'm going to trust that those in the house that know the Lord, you've at least heard these stories. But I've got to read this, Acts 9, 1. It says, meanwhile. I love that word, meanwhile. That means that a whole lot of other things are going on. Right? A whole lot of other stuff is going on in our lives. You know, we've got things to do. You know, game two is, what, about 12 o'clock? So I got about... A, about <laughs> Uh, I got about, what? Oh, man, I got five hours to preach to y'all. <laughs> Say, you're going to be preaching to yourself, amen? <laughs> we got things to do. But the Bible says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if any be found there who belonged to the way. That's what the church was known in the first century. It was called the way, not just the church. It was called the way. That if any belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly. Man, I love it when God moves suddenly. I love it when God just shows up suddenly. When we're just going through our meanwhile lives and all of a sudden God just interrupts it. I just got to tell this last little story. Not the last one because I don't know how many more I have. But I got this story. I was, I was talking about some uh, churches in Pasadena that are dealing with the gentrification and the fact that, you know, they're finding it hard to minister the way that they used to. And I keep telling that, that, that it's because many houses of worship didn't course correct. And all of a sudden now they think that the neighborhood changed like last night and it's been changing the whole time. But God has been trying to get our attention that we need to be mindful of what is moving in the realm of the Spirit. So there are those suddenly moments when God just shows up, and we need to be ready in the suddenlies, because there's suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Isn't it funny? 
that religious folks can stand on their religious beliefs with no clue as to who God really is? Paul was relentless. Paul was passionate about the word of God without knowing the God of the word. That's why some folks, man, can quote scripture with no love. No, no, no compassion. They know all the bullet points, man. And by bullet points, I mean they use the Bible like a shotgun to shoot down folks that aren't yet saved. Oh, aren't you glad that God didn't deal with you like that? That God just didn't treat you the way you deserve to be treated? What does the Bible say? Behold what manner of love the Father has for us. And while we, not them, but we were still in our sins. Do you remember? No, the Lord has removed my sins as far from the... Think, think a little while. And you might remember. I Listen, I believe that God allows us to remember where he's brought us from, not to bring condemnation, but to thank God I'm not that person anymore, to thank God that by his grace and by his mercy he picked me up, turned me around, set my feet on solid ground, that somehow God saw fit to deliver even a wretch like me amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch. Don't you point at me like me. I once... I know it's hard to believe. But I, I once was lost. Oh, but now I'm found. I was blind. But now I see. But what happened? How do I know that? Because I had one of those moments where I believe that God saw, began to work a powerful conversion in my life. That's why Jesus said that we have to be born again. You can join church and believe and say all the right, right things. There is no magical incantation to getting right. You can confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. But if there's no conversion in your spirit, you're simply reciting an incantation that has no power to bring conversion in your life. I can train a parent to say, I believe in Jesus. And guess what? And I'm not wishing any, that parent is going to die with a parent hell without God. <laughs> because it's more than just saying words. It's about a real change in our lives. And so Paul is now confronted with the fact that his religious pursuits that he sought was defending God was actually attacking God. You've heard me say this before religion without relationship I'm sorry is idolatry there's a lot of religious people there's a lot of spiritual people I think Pastor Nick touched on this on last week don't don't just buy into the hype where people say I'm spirit you know there's a lot of spirits we're gonna meet one in a minute there's a lot of spirits that sound good a lot of spirits that talk the talk but they come from a dark place and that spirit that is trying to deceive you is going to tell you what you want to hear when you want to hear it. But it's not to bring you joy. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil's M.O. He has a powerful conversion. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Paul has this amazing, powerful Conversion. I believe true discipleship requires genuine conversion. He was acquainted with the word of God, but not the God of the word. That's why he asked, who are you, Lord? Then the story goes on to say that Paul was struck blind. I, I, I believe that when Paul was, when the Bible says Paul was struck blind, it actually meant that his physical eyes were closed. But can I tell you that his physical, I mean, his spiritual eyes were closed before he was struck blind. He could see. But in order for God to get him where he wanted to, God had to blind him to his current reality. Sister Nichelle Holiday brought this up. It was a, a preacher who was preached a word, said that, that sometimes we... We fall 
for the lies of the facts, and we forget our faith. Faith does not ignore facts. It's just not dictated to by them. The Bible says that Abraham faced the fact that he was an old man. He didn't say, I'm a young, vibrant, virile, young man. He said, no, baby, I'm old. <laughs> said to his wife, baby, you old. But God made a promise, so let's go. Let's go home. Let's go home and trust the Lord together. <laughs> so, so, so they trusted God based on, come on, y'all stay in the spirit. He, they trusted God. God, according to his word, the facts didn't change. But their faith overcame and changed the facts. Faith can change the facts in your life. But sometimes God has to blind you to what you think are facts so that he can open your eyes to the realm of faith. So Paul is struck blind in this conversion process. See, as long as we keep looking at the things we've always looked at the way we've always looked at them, it becomes hard to transition into a new life. I think David got it right when he said, this is how it's done. Blessed is a man, woman, boy, or girl, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That means you got to stop hanging around the same people. Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners, no sits in the seat of the scornful, but his, her, their delight is in the law, the word of God, and in that law they meditate day and night, not Sunday and Wednesday. Got to squeeze a Tuesday in it from time to time, but they meditate day and night. Those people like trees that bring forth fruit in their season. Paul has this amazing encounter with Jesus that literally changes the course of his life. Paul was on the Damascus Road, and the next time you find him, he's on Straight Street. God will literally alter the course of your life when conversion begins. God will take you off the path that you have been following and put you on a new road. He was on the Damascus Road of his religion, and God had to blind him so that somebody else could lead him to a place called Straight. There's some folks in here, you need to ask yourself a question. Am I still on the Damascus road of my past? Or has God moved me to the straight street of his word? Because they find Saul blind in a man named Judas' house. Not Judas Iscariot, he's dead. And he's blind and he's praying and God speaks to a man by the name of Ananias. And says, I want you to go to Judas' house on the street called Straight and ask about a man named Saul. He's praying there. And Ananias has a problem because he's heard about Saul. Saul ain't nobody to be messed mess with. Saul is arresting dudes like me. Saul don't like preachers. Saul don't like the church. Saul got church hurt, and now he's trying to tear the church down. Y'all ever heard the word church hurt? A whole lot of folks that are church hurt. But the church hurt by the folks in the church. And you need to realize that as long as people are in a church, somebody might hurt you. Because some of, us are, some of us are still working this thing out. So don't let what somebody did to you in a church keep you from church. And just because I said that, uh, cloak holders, well, I didn't say it, yeah, but you sure supported it. But I digress. <laughs> so watch this. Paul had a powerful conversion, but then Paul also had a peculiar calling. Drop down to verse 15 of chapter 9. Because after Paul has this conversion, after Paul is not, God has not done, watch this. Once God gets your attention and begins to turn you, don't stop in the turning process. You've got to go all the way. There are some folks that have had, you know, encounters with God in a Sunday service. And they make all the promises. They, they become candidates for baptism. And, you know, I'm going to join this ministry and that ministry. But before God can seal the deal, they're gone. So Saul is praying. It's, it, it's not over yet. 
Saul is praying, but look at verse 16, verse 15. God says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. See, I don't, I don't know if, 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 if I want a calling to suffer. You know, folks, folks say, Lord, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Just don't make it hurt. I don't want to go nowhere that I don't, don't, don't want to go. I don't want to deal with any bad things. But you can use anything, Lord. You can. But, Lord, please don't, t- right? We, we bargain with God about how we want God to use us. But you see, Paul, I think, was kind of the unique individual that he was willing to let God use him from head to toe, no matter what. And God said, listen, I'm going to call him, but I'm going to tell him that that he's going to have to go through some things. Can I tell you that as a real disciple of Jesus Christ in the modern world that we live in, if you want to be not a follower but a disciple, that you are going to deal with some persecution in your life, and if not, you may just be a follower not a disciple. My Bible says that if anyone wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, that you are going to suffer some persecution. Persecution is not optional. And I think sometimes we run from it. Help me, Father God. Sometimes I think we run from what God is sending us to. God sends us out into a world that is antagonistic to his word, and then we wonder why people don't want to hear us. He closed the door in my face. They hung up. That's supposed to happen. People are supposed to separate themselves from you. It's not something that you want, but the light of God's presence in you repels the darkness that is in them. You are an example of the fact that their life is not what it's supposed to be. And because they're not ready to follow the Lord, they retreat to the darkness. And they retreat to the darkness by pushing you away. Pastor, much wiser than me, said, when you get saved, you don't have to leave your friends because they're going to leave you. They don't want to hear that talk. It amazes me sometimes to hear people that I believe are Christians saying that other folks are almost too much Christian. They always talk about the Lord. They always want to go to worship service. Every conversation, they got to turn it up. God help us. Paul had a peculiar calling. He was supposed to be filled with the Spirit. Now watch out, Paul. Help me, Father God, because I got to flip through this thing quickly. I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just in your hearing. But you can write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. I want you to hear Paul's testimony about how Paul looked at the sufferings in his life. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. He's comparing himself with, with others who believe that their calling is greater than his. Because you know that there are churches, there are, there are well-known pastors that, that will tell you that if you're persecuted, something is wrong with your faith. If you're going through anything, that somehow there's something wrong with your faith. I'm not talking about something I think. I'm talking about something I've seen, something I've heard. I'm talking about renowned people. I'm not going to judge their heart. That's God's business. But when I hear folks say things that don't square up with God's word, I personally have a problem. Pray for me. Because watch what Paul says. In verse 23, Paul says, are they servants of Christ? I'm not out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. I just see Paul standing there, not bent over making an apology, but he's boasting. You want to talk about service? Let me tell you. My service outdoes all of them. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times. Paul, 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 never waste a pain. Never waste a lesson of the pain. Paul will say, you know what? I forget how many times 
I was beaten. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Paul said, five times I received the 40 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once pelted with stone. Three times a shipwreck. Spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constant." on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, of danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, danger of the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger in the sea, danger of false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides uh, everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I don't feel weak? Who's led to sin and I don't inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus who has been praised forever knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor of, under King uh, Arita had the city of Damascus guarded in order to arrest me, but I was loaded in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through their hands. Paul is not making excuses. Paul has a peculiar calling. And I believe that if we're going to be the kind of people God is calling for, what has God called me to? Has God called me to endure some things? Has God called me to Go through some things. Man, I've been a lot of time and haven't even gotten to my main point because all this time has been leading to Acts chapter 16. See, because once you had a powerful conversion and you recognize there's a peculiar conflict sooner or later, you're going to deal with public conflict. You're going to be confronted in your walk when you're a disciple. It's easier to be a follower than a disciple. But followers and disciples end up in different places. Followers quit when the going gets tough. Followers leave when the fish run out and when the bread gets stale. Followers leave when the, leave when the miracles aren't as plentiful anymore. When their needs aren't being met. When that church wasn't feeding me no more. You didn't learn how to feed yourself? God didn't show you how to take the word of God and do something on your own. And let me say this, this too. I believe that church membership can be seasonal. That I don't have to leave a church because I've got a problem with it. That church may have served the season that I was in. I needed to be encouraged, and so I went to a church that was very encouraging. But now that I've been encouraged, now I need a, a church that doesn't just focus on encouragement. It, fo it focuses on my depth. And there's a church down the road. There's a church uh, across the street that is much more, they'll walk you through the verses, you know. And so I don't have to necessarily stay attached out of a conviction that I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. That church just served its purpose. And now I'm going to go somewhere else. But don't just leave and don't tell nobody. Mercy, Father God. In Acts chapter 16, I'm going to have to really paraphrase this. Paul is now being used by God. He's no longer a persecutor of the church. He's a proclaimer of biblical truth. In Acts chapter 16, he runs into a territorial spirit, a young girl who had a spirit of divination by which she was able to predict the future. And the people in the town, they made a lot of money off of this woman, either, you know, through the merchandising of her divination. And the Bible says that she begins by saying something very true. She says, these men are the mighty men of God that lead the way to salvation. Nothing wrong with that message. But just because something sounds right and just because something makes you feel right doesn't mean that it has divine origin. See, Satan is the master of deception. Satan will use the word of God to draw people away from God because they don't know God. They're trusting in the words that someone else teaches, but they haven't gone and looked, at, looked it up for themselves. So the Bible says, watch this, that, that she did this for many days. How many of you know that Satan is relentless too? Satan will give you what, what you want to hear as long as you want to hear it. But when God says it's time for you to hear my voice, and you're going to have to dismiss the voices that have kept you bound to your past, 
Some of us are still listening to the demons of our past. And they're trying to keep you from being the saint that God has called you to in this generation. But because there's just enough to make you comfortable with the shortcomings of your past, as opposed to facing the challenges of your future, you allow that spirit to continue. You know you're better than that. You know God has called you for higher things than that. But it's easier just to kind of stay and listen to the voices that make me feel comfortable than the voices that challenge, I'm trying, brother, than the voices that challenge me to go higher. So watch what happens. Listen, watch what happens. The Bible says that he gets so fed up, one day he turns around and rebukes the spirit. I'm going to ask you all, please go read this for yourself because I can't take time to go verse by verse today. He cast the spirit out, and when he cast the spirit out, suddenly people got a problem. You know why the world really doesn't have the problem that it's going to have with the church today? Because the church doesn't cast out the spirits that are running roughshod in our communities. The church is no threat to the local spirits that still murder kids in the street, that still divide houses and still tear up marriages. Where is the power of this God that we say that we have when we can leave this place and the world right outside our door is unchanged? See, Paul was able to preach and was able just to do for many days until suddenly he started casting out spirits. Then watch what happens. They arrest him. Y'all know the story. Paul and Silas. They arrest him, beat him, put him in jail. Help me, Father God even though Paul was a Roman citizen. We're going to find out that after all is said and done, Paul invokes his Roman citizenship. But here's another thing the Lord put on my heart. Sometimes I think we are trying to escape what God is calling us to endure. Just going to let that marinate. Paul could have said, I'm sorry, y'all can't do me like this. I'm a Roman citizen. But I believe that not only did Paul have a public, con Paul had a private confidence that even though God was calling him to do something difficult, he had to go through it rather than run from it. The church that God is looking for today is not a church that's trying to run away from problems. I wonder how many churches are talking today about the abortion issue going on in the world right now. And the very fact that I said that just changed the whole atmosphere in this house. Because that is one of the biggest political hot buttons in the world. And I'm going to tell you this, that as the world, the world has to make its own decisions. But those that follow Christ, we have to answer to him. God said life begins when God speaks. God said to Jeremiah that before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. That before you even were born, I had a purpose for you. We can debate that some other time. But I believe that we're going to have to confront some things in, in the world that is much more easy not to talk about than to deal with. Paul could have said, I don't have to deal with, with this. But I believe that he had a conviction that if he goes through something, that if he engages in the difficult things, that God was going to show him something that he never would have seen if he hadn't gone through it. Do you believe that, I must not do you believe, I believe that there's some miracles that God wants to perform in the lives of his people that you have to go through to get to. We don't want to go through it. God said the only way to it is through. The only way to it is through it. Paul allowed himself, Silas allowed himself to be arrested. Why? Because there was a dude working a graveyard shift in the local jail that needed to hear the word of God. You know why sometimes God will allow you to lose your job? Because there's somebody in the unemployment line that you might have 30 seconds to talk to. But I don't want to lose my job. Nobody wants to lose their job. But I'm going to trust God 
that whatever happens, sometimes I'm going to have to go through it to get to it. I don't want to get that diagnosis. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to have to go through anything. Lord, but if you're calling me, I have a private confidence. Like Paul said, I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor jail, nor, nor anything can separate me from God's love. I'm talking about discipleship here. I'm talking about a relentless discipleship. There's some folks in this room you have been going through, it seems like literal hell in your life. You don't have to testify because there's some things you don't want folks to know, and there's some folks that don't need to know what you're going through because they're not going to use it as part of your testimony. They're going to use it to talk about you and not be able to bless you. So sometimes you need to keep your struggles to yourself and those that can pray for you. But I believe that God is trying to lead somebody through a thing right now. That you're asking God to take you out of, keep on praying that God take you from it. But while you're in it, Lord, show me the person, the lesson that I need to learn. Because God, will not only will he bring you to it, he'll bring you through it. I, somebody should thank God for that. Paul allowed himself. We love at the midnight hour. <laughs> God uh, touched Paul and Silas, and, and they, started pray they started praying in the darkness of a cave that they chose to go through. We want God to show up in the midnight hour, but we don't want to go through the prison system to get there. Lord, have mercy. But watch what happens. God brings to pass this amazing miracle because Paul was relentless in his discipleship, he had a private confidence, and I'm going to end on this. I believe all, not only do we need to have a powerful conversion, a peculiar calling, deal with public conflict, possess a private confidence, I think we need to have just a little pinch of crazy. you got to be just a little just some, something somewhere just doesn't line up with the world. Because after Paul comes through it, they announce your punishment is over. You can go home and be free. Go to verse 35. Will you? Chapter Acts. 16, 35, is that right, Miss Lasia? 16, 35, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. In other words, your punishment is over. Isn't it great? When you know that the season of difficulty is over, and you should just come to church and testify, I went to jail or whatever it was, and God brought, brought me out. Paul just wasn't done yet. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said, parenthetically, oh, heck no. They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens. Again, Paul could have said this earlier. We are Roman citizens and threw us into prison, and now they want to get rid of us quietly? Nope. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them. What does the Bible say? When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll even make your enemies be at peace. The folks that threw them into prison now have to escort them out. See, but I believe that you just got to have just a pinch of crazy in you to wait around after you've been set free, after you've been delivered, 
after you've seen the miracle, to realize that God is not done yet. Some of you got to stop going quietly when the enemy says he's done with you. Listen, you might be done with me, devil, but I'm not done with you. You got to fix some things. You done destroyed my family, and now you're going to tell me that I can just go in peace? Oh, heck no. We're going to fix those things. You're going to help me. I'm going to call on the name of Jesus, and God is going to turn my enemies and make them serve his purpose in my life. Don't you walk away until God has caused the enemy to make amends for the things that he has done. I'm preaching to somebody today. So they came to appease him, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they still didn't leave. They went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and the sisters Encourage them, then they left. You know what that is? This is the last little point. That's the posture of a conqueror. See, even though you beat me down, God's still going to lift me up. Even though when I've endured everything the enemy can throw at me, God is going to cause me to stand up and declare that you might have beat me but you didn't beat me. You might have knocked me down, but I'm going to get up time and time again because God says I'm more than a conqueror. Can I encourage those of you in this place today? I'm talking about relentless discipleship. If you've had a conversion experience in your life, you've been confronted with where you were going and God has called you now, and you got this peculiar feeling, if God has called me, why am I still going through? these difficult things because God is going to use you in those moments. He's not saved you to punish you. He saved you because he has perfected you to do what nobody but you can do. And yes, he wants you to feel the joy of his spirit, but there may be some times where he leads you down a dark path. Not to take you down, but to show his glory through you because you said you would let him use, use you. Let him use you in those difficult times. But have that conviction. Lord, I know you're doing something in the midst of it. I don't like the prison. I don't like these shackles on my feet. But in Jesus' name, I'm going to go through it. I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to stay here, Lord, as long as you would have me to because there's somebody who might be watching. Because remember when they were praising God? The Bible says that the prisoners heard them. There are people in bondage to the things that used to hold you, and they're listening. Are you complaining, or are you praising? Because, because the song that you sing to them will determine whether they are free or not. If you sing the song of woe is me, they'll believe there's no way out for them either. But if you sing... I've been through the storm and the rain, but I made it. God is going to do some incredible things. But just a pinch, just a pinch of crazy. Because in this crazy world, you've got to be just a little crazy. Because I think it was Peter said, I've become a fool for Christ's sake. Call me what you will, but watch God do some incredible things. If you are blessed at all with anything in that rush message, can you give God some praise for that? Come on. We got to be relentless in this thing. Don't give up. Don't give up. Paul had that peculiar calling. God told him, I got to, you're going to have to go through some stuff. As a disciple in Jesus, you are going to have to endure some things that you might choose not to. But if you let God take you through it, I believe he can take you to that blessing that waits on the other side. Don't run from everything. Isn't it the, the armed forces, the, the Marines, the Army, first responders are celebrated because they run towards the conflict? Can I tell you in the name of Jesus, 
that as believers in Jesus Christ, that God has called us into this world to be his first responders? That when we see the breakdown in the community, we're not supposed to run from it. We're supposed to run to it. When we see our children being slain in schools and on the street, God doesn't call us to run, come run from it. He calls us to run to it. Because when we get to it, he'll take us through it. And the miracle is waiting on the other side. My God! Woo. Relentless. But you got to be relentless. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, at the right time, you'll reap a harvest. There's a harvest that's waiting for us right outside our doors. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, the relentless believers are few. Let's pray. Let's pray for an Ekbalo moment. I saw all y'all bow your heads. Good. While you're bowing your heads, pray that Ekbalo will take place. Y'all know what that word means? You should. It's a Greek word that Jesus said, harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Ask ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send ekbalo, laborers. That word means to forcibly eject, to thrust forth, to cast out. People are dying, going to hell, while believers go to church. God said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And you're going to have to have a relentless attitude because the world is going to try to co convince you. It's frightening, it's scary, it's dangerous. But if you trust in God and we run to it, God will see us. I believe that is the word for this house and for us, that we must go to it so God will see us through it. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, I pray, I pray, oh God, today that this word, Father, that has sat on my heart will first, oh God, bear fruit in me. God forbid that I should preach to others and I myself become a castaway. Help me to be relentless, Father God, in my pursuit of you. Remind me of that moment when you came, oh God, and changed the course of my life. I have wandered from it, but you have brought me back time and time again. And I believe, oh God, that on me and on us, there is a peculiar, a very specific calling for each one of us to go through and endure what only you can give us the strength to. Because, Lord, we're going to come in conflict with the world that tries to quiet this message tries to keep us from being effective in casting out spirits and raising the dead and opening the blinded eyes. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Give us that private conviction, Father God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Give us, oh God, just that little pinch of what might be seen as crazy to hang on, oh God, and to see it through to the very end. We love you, we bless you, we praise you. We ask your glory to be manifest in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and praise God. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, not know about him, not just join a church, you've been a follower, but God is calling you to discipleship. That's next level commitment. It's more than joining a church. It's more than just going to a service. It's saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be who you called me to be. And I'm going to face whatever needs to be faced so that you'll be glorified in my life. That is a call that is going out today. Yes, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, but that implies I'm surrendering as a servant. It's no longer what I want. It's what he wants. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Right here, right now, that conversion process can start. You can be saved. God can change you from the D Damascus road of your past and put you on the straight street of his purpose for your life. And then we will pray, as Ananias prayed, that you will be filled with the Spirit of God. Overwhelmed, overcome with the reality of the living, breathing presence.
presence of the Holy Ghost so that whatever you face, you'll come out more than a conqueror because that's what God has for you. If you're here in this place, this invitation is for you. If you made that decision years ago, but you've gotten away from it, you're what the Bible calls a backslider. Your commitment, your zeal is not where it used, used to be. God has said, I'm married to you. I want to restore that relationship. You can come also and recommit your life to the Lord. Not even join a church, just recommit to Him. But if you're here and you don't have a church home, we believe that this is a place where you'll be encouraged to be who God has called you to be. As we all stand to our feet, if God is speaking to your heart, you want to get saved, you want to recommit, you want to become a part of a church family, this is your opportunity, this is your time. Come on, you all. John chapter 5, Jesus fed the 5,000, 5,000 men plus women and children. And they ate so much they had leftovers. The next day, Jesus had moved on to the other side of the lake. And when the people realized that Jesus had left, they followed him. A group of 5,000 men plus women and children. That sometimes I think is what we have a measure of what church is supposed to be a large number of people following Jesus but then Jesus seems to turn on them and he basically asked them what are you really looking for he said the reason why many this is John 5 the reason why many of you followed me here is not so much because of who I am not even for the miraculous power of God is you want more bread and more fish and Jesus says my body you must eat my flesh and drink my blood and even though Jesus was speaking in spiritual terms he confronted where they were and many of those followers stopped following because it suddenly was no longer about what they could get from him, but what he required of them. God is a God who blesses us tremendously. He feeds us with his word, satisfies us with living water by his spirit, but then he challenges our motives. Are we following Jesus for what we can get from him? Or are we learning as disciples so that we can become like him? Disciples aren't just learning to get. We're learning to be. And to be disciples of Jesus Christ in 2019 is no less difficult and no less rewarding than it was when he called the first disciples. God is calling us, Friendship Pasadena. He's calling us to be 
his representatives in the earth to face our challenges because of what he has done for us. Communion is a reminder of the price that Jesus paid, the relentless price that Jesus paid. He allowed his body to be broken, to be battered, bruised, and beaten on a cross. He allowed his blood to be spilled for our redemption and our forgiveness. And as we partake of these elements, it's a reminder of that sacrifice. We do not teach transubstantiation down here. We don't teach that this becomes his body. Jesus died once. He doesn't have to keep dying. He shed his blood once. He doesn't have to keep shedding it. But this is an act of faith that we believe that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that before we partake of this, I need to ask myself a question. Am I serving God on his terms or on my own? And if I can say to myself, I'm really not yet committed to him, the Bible says we should let these elements pass. There's no salvation in this table, but there can be judgment, even damnation. You can ask God to forgive you right now. You can pray a prayer of repentance. Father God, I pray that everything in my life that's not like you, first of all, Father, that you would reveal it to me. Give me the strength to turn from it. But then forgive me and cleanse me in the blood of the Lamb. I purpose, Father God, to live for you from this day forward. I can't concern myself with tomorrow, for tomorrow has trouble of its own. But right here, right now, Father, I pray that I be found worthy because I believe that your body was broken so that I might live, that your blood was spilled so that I might be forgiven. And as I partake of this body and partake of this blood, I become one with you. Have your way, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. For the Bible declares that the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Then after they had eaten, he took the cup and said, this now is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus said, I shall not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So search your hearts today. Are we followers? Or are we disciples? Not all followers are disciples, but all disciples are followers. Let's follow Jesus all the way. Praise God. The broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This do as often as you do it in remembrance of him. Come on, y'all. The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on, way back on Calvary, for the blood that gives me strength.
having to say farewell to a loved one and especially a, a parent and our hearts are broken with you we have been praying for you grateful that God has brought you back home but by his spirit we pray he brings that comfort and that he surrounds you with the friendship family to extend that love to you also because it was God's love that said the same night in which Jesus was betrayed he took bread blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples said take and eat, this is my body broken for you after they had eaten Jesus took the cup and said this now is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins he said, I shall not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All of you drink of it. After they had eaten, they sang a hymn. They went out into the Mount of Olives and they accomplished what God has called them to accomplish. So can you stand? Let's sing one verse of this song and go make a difference for God's glory. Come on, choir. Oh, what can wash away my sin? Said nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what can make me? 